All right, let me pray for us before we jump in. Well, Father, again, we just thank you that you've gathered us together here this morning. What a glorious day and what a wonderful time that we've had worshiping you and seeing how you move in the African nation of Senegal. So we just thank you for your presence here with us this morning. And Lord, now we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and to be with us because we know that as the Holy Spirit is here, there can be no spirit of distraction in the room. And we know that as your Holy Spirit is here, there can be no spirit of doubt or confusion in the room. Only the Holy Spirit may speak and move and have his way in this place. And Holy Spirit, we do long and ask for you to come and to move this morning. Amen. 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 Well, most of you know that from time to time, I like to take a theme or an idea and then build a theology for it. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to build a theology by looking at a lot of different passages of Scripture. That's how we do that. We build theology by looking at the whole context of Scripture and not just a proof text. I hate that when someone tries to make a point and there's only one Scripture that says that. That's not good theology. We build theology by looking at Scripture as a whole and bringing in many passages. And so that's what I want to look at today. And I want to build a theology for the idea of living under the favor of God. Although this is really just an introduction, I can't adequately cover this topic in one message. I've been wanting to give this message on living under the favor of God for a long time, but I, I, honestly, I didn't know where to start. And so I find just, I got to start somewhere. I woke up Wednesday morning with this just burning in my mind. I'm like, like I got to do this. And so I'm just starting with the basics. This is just an introduction. At some point in time, this will probably be a three or a five part sermon series and maybe a book. Because there's a lot here, but I'm just starting today with the basics, all right? So why is it important to live under the favor of God? What are the benefits of living under the favor of God? Well, I've got a few here. I'm sure there are many. First, when we live under the favor of God, God protects and breathes life into our finances. I'm going to move that just so I don't tag into it. When we live under the favor of God, God protects and blesses our finances. When we live under the favor of God, our finances are not affected by recessions. When we live under the favor of God, our finances are not affected by inflation. Oh, come on now, Pastor, you're stepping on my toes. <laughs> right? Think about how worked up we get about things like inflation and recessions. But this is why I wanted to talk about this. When we live under the favor of God, I'm not subject to that. Amen. You see, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And that never changes. Psalm 50, verse 10. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Can you imagine if a recession hits the American economy and suddenly God has fewer cows on the hills? <laughs> Number two, the second reason this is so important. When we live under God's favor, he protects our health. We are not buffeted about by the sicknesses of the season. And if we do get sick, we make dramatic recovery with little loss. I think my stroke would be a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amen. I had a stroke on Thursday and I stood before you all on Sunday. Mm. Wow. Number three, when we live under the favor of God, he protects our belongings. Our clothes and our shoes don't wear out. Deuteronomy 29, which we're going to look at in just a minute. Here's the first scripture I really want to look at. Stephen, put up Psalm 5. Psalm 5, verse 10. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Now, remember, last week I talked about new covenant thinking. We have to see things through the new covenant, right? Remember that? So we have to look at this through New Covenant thinking. You bless the righteous. Because of Christ, I am the righteousness of Christ. This isn't something I have to go work at. I am the righteousness of Christ. Because I am the righteousness of Christ, God blesses me with his favor, which is a shield. Do we live that way? Do we understand that and live that way? That because I am the righteousness of Christ, I have a shield around me that is the favor of God. And then number four. Gosh, I'm getting all worked up, but I'm still in the introduction. <laughs> 
Number four, when we live under the favor of God, he will protect our relationships. Lifelong marriages are rooted in favor. Amy and I have been married for 34 years, and there's been a lot of God's favor in our life. And that's what's got us to this point. So now the big question is, how do we live under the favor of God? Well, I have a few thoughts, just the basics again. This is an introduction. I'm not going to show you anything that you haven't seen before, but I'm going to try to put them together into a, co a cohesive whole that forms a theology and a foundation to live our lives differently. Right? Who wants their life to be recession-proof? Who wants to have a shield of protection around you, right? We all want those things. We just need the theology and the foundation to know how to live that way. So as I go through these, I want you to consider how these can become a natural way of life for you, if they aren't already. But these are all deeply rooted in the character and nature of God. To live under the favor of God, I must understand the character of God and his nature. It's so important, okay? Because his character is his love and his care for us, so he wants us to have this favor and this protection. But as I look around the Christian world today and the church today, there are just too many people that are living without this favor, without the favor of God over their lives. They tell me about all the cl calamity that's going on in their life and the financial hardships and the sicknesses, and I'm like, yeah, that's not the favor of God. So let's jump in and figure out how we can live under the favor of God. Number one, generosity. If you want the favor of God, we must be generous as a lifestyle. Stephen put up Proverbs 11. <clears throat> One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessings on the one who is willing to sell. I want to look at verse 24 in the NLT. Stephen, go to the next one, this NLT. The NLT gives a dramatic wording. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. That just sums it up and just nails it down right there in a verse, doesn't it? See, God is a generous God, and he expects us to live the same way. This is rooted in that character and nature of God that I talked about. We have to understand the character of God, that he is a generous God, and if I want his favor, I live his way, I live according to his plan, which is generosity. Amy and I love to be generous with others, and we have so many stories, and God has always shown us great favor in return. Here's the thing, if you don't have much, be generous with what you have. If all you have is time, be generous with your time. Here's the thing. Once you get over the fear of being generous, it actually becomes a lot of fun. But it's rooted in understanding that my God is generous. And when I'm generous, then I get his generosity. Once we overcome the fear of being generous, it becomes fun. I want to look at one more slide. Stephen put up uh, Luke 12. <clears throat> Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. That sounds like protection, doesn't it? Yes. Hmm. So here's the, I want you to catch this. In the economy of the kingdom, giving protects what we have. If you want to protect what you have, give. Share. You know, as I was reading through my notes this morning, I was reminded of a story that applies to our church from many, many years ago. James, I think you were on the board then. We were having a church board meeting on a Saturday morning, and I told the board, I said, you know what? We have too much money. Let's give a whole bunch of money away today. And so we picked a whole bunch of other Christ-centered organizations that we support, a deliverance ministry and some missions organizations, and we gave away $10,000 at that meeting. We just wrote checks and mailed them out. The next day at church, James heads up the team that counts offering. He came out and he said, Tim, it didn't work. There's an extra $20,000 in the offering today. <laughs> I mean, 
Amen. <laughs> now, as we look at this verse, I don't want you to think of it as literal. A thief can't steal what I don't have, and what I don't have can't wear out my purse. This is a spiritual principle. Jesus only teaches spiritual principles. He's not saying a thief can't steal what you don't have. He's saying in the economy of the kingdom, giving protects what you have. Don't think of this. Is that God calling? <laughs> Sorry. All right. Stinking family. <laughs> it's the family of God. It's my kids. I thought I'd turn that off. It's all good. <clears throat> and now don't think of this as give in order to get. That's not it at all. This is live generously because my God is generous and I want his favor. Yes. I want to have fun partnering with God in generosity. So you might ask, well, who am I to be generous to? Everyone around you. People at the grocery store, whatever. My daughter, Carney, was, she works at Aldi now, and she was telling me today that some lady at Aldi paid for the groceries for the person in front of her and paid for the groceries for the person behind her. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh. There used to be people in this church, they were regular attenders in this church, that came here because I had paid for the groceries at Aldi. There's a woman sitting in the room who is here because I gave her a 100% tip on my bill. I don't say that to, hey, look at me. No, I'm no. giving you examples of what living generously looks like. Right? All right, the second one is obedience. The favor of the Lord is rooted in obedience. Stephen put up Deuteronomy 6. <clears throat> And the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so he can continue to bless us and pre preser preserve our lives as he has done to this day. Do a word search in the Old Testament for the word obey and see how many times their prosperity and safety was tied to their obedience. I can't even begin to touch the issue of obedience in the Old Testament. There are so many passages and so many stories that relate to that. Uh, really quickly, I'm not going to put it up, but Proverbs 16, 20 says, Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. Jesus, of course, continued that message of obedience in the New Testament. Uh, Stephen, Luke, uh, Luke 11, I think it is. He replied, blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. We get blessings from the Lord through obedience, right? Amen. Now, the idea of obedience must be a way of life and not just when someone is watching or you need something. Of course, that could go on, on obedience all day, but for the sake of time, we won't. Number three, trust. The favor of God is very much rooted in complete trust of the Lord. This one's going to get hard for us. Matthew 6 to begin with, Stephen. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus is making the point that the birds do not have to worry about their provision because they trust the Lord. The same applies to us. We live under the favor of the Lord when we walk in absolute trust. We must trust that everything that God does is good and perfect. Stephen James 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Mm -hmm. Perfecto regalo, bienedetti. We used to sing that song in Spanish. Now, all of us would look at this and go, yeah, yeah, I agree that God is good and everything he does is good. Yeah, yeah, I believe in the goodness of God. I'm going to chip you all up. Verse, Romans 13, Stephen. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Wait, I want blessings and favor, not judgment. 
This text says that all governing authorities are from God, which means they're good and perfect, according to James, and that we must be subject to them. Now I hear Christians get really silly and goofy and try to rationalize this away. Oh no, that only applies if the government's following God. It doesn't say that in the text. It doesn't say you must submit when the government is following God. It just says all authority is from God and you must submit. Because it's good and perfect. Do you believe it? I heard a Christian this week make the most disparaging comments about our current president. This says that will bring judgment on you. Do you see that? Do you see how our attitude towards certain things can hinder the favor of God? If I believe that everything is good and perfect, then I have to believe that the authorities and the government he has put over me is good and perfect as well. That's a hard sell sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> the book of Proverbs also says, the rules of kings are just. When we start to call into question government, we are calling into question the goodness and the perfectness of the God who put them there. And he will remove his favor from our life and bring judgment. We see it here in this verse. Now here's another concept. Scripture also tells us that God is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. If you trust something else, he will leave you to what you have trusted. If you trust something other than the favor of God, God will turn you over to what you have trusted. Uh, a story that I thought of this week, Amy and I used to have this friend. He was a millionaire. In fact, he was a multi-millionaire. He had, he had made millions of dollars investing very wisely. But instead of seeing that as the favor of God on his life, that God had allowed him to make millions of dollars. He trusted the lottery. Every week he bought tons and tons and tons of lottery tickets. He bought so many lottery tickets, he had to pay someone to check them to see if he had won. God had led him to a place where he had made millions of dollars, and he trusted the lottery. You know what happened to that man? He filed for bankruptcy. Twice, I think. God turned him over to what he trusted because he didn't see the fact that he had made millions of dollars was the favor of God on his life and he trusted the lottery. He's now bankrupt and living penis, penis, penny lead, penny list list. Wow. <laughs> better voice by better? Stroke check on myself here? All right. Moving on to number four. Bless others. Again, this is how we live under the favor of God. Bless others. Stephen put up Jeremiah 29. This is closely tied to being generous, but as I seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile, pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Hmm. <clears throat> as we seek to bless our city, the city will be a blessing to us. And again, this is a spiritual principle. We have to understand this as a spiritual principle. Why do you think I was so very actively involved in the Chamber of Commerce for over 10 years? I was trying to find ways to bless my city. Mm -hmm. And there are people in this room today that are here because of my involvement in the Chamber. Mm -hmm. See in Proverbs 11. Through the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted but by, mouth, by the mouth of the wicked it is destroyed. Do you realize we can bless our city into our own prosperity? As I speak blessings over my city, that translates into the favor of God in my life. Do you see that? Number five, a thankful heart. We walk in the favor of God with a thankful heart. Stephen, Deuteronomy 29. I love this passage is great. Yet the Lord says, During the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. 
the context here is that God is pointing out how he had taken care of them during the wilderness years and they didn't realize it. God is that good. He can take care of us and we don't even notice and he goes with it. Now he did remove some of the favor, favor from the people of Israel, but during the wilderness years, the people only complained about what they didn't have. God, make us slaves again. I want garlic. God, make us slaves again. I want leeks and onions. And God's like, did you notice your clothes haven't worn out and your shoes haven't worn out and it's been 40 years? Now, my, my wife might accuse me of having some clothes that are 40 years old, but that's different. <laughs> I just don't like change. <clears throat> but I wonder if this verse is a word for us today. God, have you seen the price of chicken? Have you seen the price of eggs? And God's like, yeah, but are you noticing what I am doing? Yeah. Tim's got clothes that are 40 years old. <laughs> Noticing the little things that God does and having a thankful heart will bring more favor. 100%. Just take that to the bank. Noticing the little things that God does and having a thankful heart will bring more favor. This verse speaks to the sovereignty of God over our circumstances. He can prevent our shoes from wearing out. Can you trust a God like that? Can you trust a God that is so good, even if you don't have garlic in your diet or you can't afford chicken, he still takes care of your clothing and your shoes? Amen. See, this goes back to that trust issue I talked about. The character and nature of God. Can I trust in the absolute good nature of God to even do things like take care of my shoes? Number six. Listen and obey to the Holy Spirit. Stephen put up James 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously, because he is a generous God, to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Back in 2012, Amy and I needed a new car. As we prayed about the various options to pay for this car, the Holy Spirit showed me an option that I had not previously thought of. So we went with his option, even though that option was really scary. But having gone with that option, that decision is still paying financial dividends to us all these years later. The Spirit of God told us to buy the house that we live in, which was ridiculous. Our real estate agent took us to look at this house. It was way out of our price range, and it was already under contract. I'm like, why are we looking at it? And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me clear as day. He spoke to me, and then in a dream that night, and said, buy that house. I'm like, but it's way out of our price range, and it's already sold. So we made an offer. God did some crazy miracles, and we got the house, even though it was already con under contract. And even though it was way out of our price range, we've already paid it off. Amen. And was the church here then? Church was in our home. We started the church in, our, in that home. So. The God, I kind of wanted us to have that house because that house lent itself well to starting a church in it. Yeah. Right? And the fact that we paid it off doesn't have anything to do with how much money we make. If you were at the manual meeting this year, you saw that I don't make anything. She's retired. So number six was listen and obey the Holy Spirit. Number seven, tithe. It's not possible to live under the favor of God if you're not tithing. Stephen Malachi 3. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. That's a great promise right there. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. He's talking about favor there. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse. The whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in your house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. 
and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it all. Here's the favor. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and your vines in their fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. That all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. In this one passage, I don't have time to get into it, gosh, we're way over, but in this one passage, God says, I will restore favor, I will protect your crops, I'll give you everything you want. Just bring me the tithe. Because they hadn't been, they had been ripping him off, and they had not been bringing in the tithe. It's an unpopular subject in the American church for some reason. If you don't believe this, or if you've never tried it, just take God at his word, try it, and see what a difference it makes. Pastor Jerry's, or Jerry, our, work, our guest worship leader today, his pastor of his church did a message where he goes, I am so confident in this. If you start tithing and God doesn't completely change your finances, I'll refund all the money you gave. Not a single person came and asked for the refund. <laughs> None of what I mentioned today is a one-time thing. Do this once and your life will change. Don't hear that. This is all lifestyle stuff. This is day in and day out, and that's what makes it hard. To live under the favor of God and to live with these basic principles I just shared with you, it's day in and day out. It has become your natural tendency. This, is, this becomes who you are to be generous and to trust the Lord unbelievably, unrelentingly, even when things in the world don't seem to be going the way you want them to. This is hard only because it's just day in and day out. But when you get over the fear, it becomes fun. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Jerry, I crash landed, so it's back to you. <laughs>